Good morning, friends. I welcome you as we're gathered together this morning, a beautiful, beautiful spring morning for Mother's Day. I can tell you that I have had many memories of Mother's Day where there was snow flying through the air. It's so nice not to have that with us today. And uh, we also... Uh, Hope that all you mothers have a wonderful day today. And as we come together, I want to remind you of some special things uh, that I look forward to. Now, next Sunday is the third Sunday of the month, which is our Friendship Sunday. And so you are encouraged to invite someone to come to church with you. And uh, I know we're going to be having ham and uh, we'll be having some yams and also mac and cheese because this woman always brings mac and cheese. So if you want to bring something and along with a friend, and after our worship, we then continue our fellowship over a meal. So I hope that you'll come and join us and invite someone to come along uh, with you as well. We also, next Sunday, will be taking a special love offering in which that the funds that we receive from that love offering go to help pro provide for the resources for our lunches that we pack for the homeless, which will take pl place not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. So I hope that you will remember those two events and that you'll participate with us fully. I also want to uh, remind you that, uh, and I'm Charlie is going to pass these out to all of you. We have a booklet here called Mothers of Faith. And these, uh, the children that change the world, these are the stories of the mothers of people who truly dramatically impacted our world today. And I think you'll find them very useful. So, Charlie, go ahead if you'd like to pass those out as we begin our worship. That would be very fine. So I invite you to make sure that you take those with you. We also want to say how, well, how we are uh, thankful that Sylvia is back. Well, I appreciate the music that we can have on the, the CDs. It's just not the same, especially when they don't give you time to breathe in between verses. <laughs> well, you don't quite know when it's going to start, but it's, uh, we're thankful for Sylvia and her gifts and what she provides to us as well. Without further ado, I invite you to uh, join us in our call to worship. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Good morning. Good morning, my friends and family in Christ. I invite you to begin with me at this time of worship together 
with an affirmation of our common faith. It comes from Hymn 92. I will read the verse and I ask you to respond to the chorus. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour of the day and night, hill and vale, tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of night. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of the ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony <coughs> linking sense and sound and sight. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, and the gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to thee be raised, this our hymn of grateful praise. For the church that evermore lifts its holy hands above, offering upon every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. For thyself, thy best gift, thy be best gift divine, to the world so freely give. For the great, great love of thine, peace on earth and joy divine. Lord of all, to thee we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. And I invite you now, if you could rise where you are seated and lift your voice with mine as we sing number 89 joyful joyful we adore thee joyful joyful we adore thee god of glory lord of love hearts unfold Son above, melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away, giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rain. Unbroken praise, field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love art thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join us. stars began, love divine is reigning o'er us, winding all within its van, ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife, joyful music leads us onward, in the triumph song of love. God, as you are already standing, turn, kindly turn and greet one another with the peace and love of Jesus Christ.
is here with us even as we worship and praise his holy name. Please join your voice with mine as we pray together what we possess to, to believe. Oh my living Lord, I dare to believe these things, that you, O oh God, are the God of all the earth, both the living and the dead, that you have revealed yourself in Jesus in order that we may follow his teachings and come to eternal life. That the spirit of your son, Jesus, is in this place today, inviting us to a greater commitment of our lives and bestowing the power to live in that commitment. That the church, for all its shortcomings, is still that place where we can find healing and grace a place to love and be loved, and be compelled to live the love we have been shown. That the world outside these walls is where we are called to live out the love we know in Christ, and to invite into the family where love can always be found. Turn our best intentions into the reality we want to live as we worship you. Amen. On this Mother's Day, and I've probably done this before, but uh, I've translated a passage uh, from Scripture, and uh, I've shared it before, I'm sure, here. If not, be new to you. But it comes to us from Proverbs 31. My attempt in translating it from the original language is merely to try to make it more contemporary for us, because it is written at another time and age. It's Proverbs 31 is known as a writing acknowledging a virtuous woman. Who can find a confident, kind-hearted, virtuous woman? She is more valuable, far above anything this world can offer. Her husband loves her with his whole heart. He can always count on her, confident that she will always bring him good and not harm. And she loves him with her whole heart, forgiving him for his faults, and encouraging his talents. She works hard contributing to the well-being of her family. She balances the budget, purchases, and prepares wonderful meals. She gets up early to get her family off for the day. She possesses a good head for business and is never extravagant, but always thrifty. She works hard to multiply what life gives her so that it is enough and more for her family. She is always a wise steward of her resources. She is knowledgeable and capable and does not go to bed early before everything is done for the day and ready for tomorrow. 
She doesn't waste her time or emotional energy comparing her life to others. She recognizes the abundance of her own blessings most of the time and generously shares her talents, compassion, and material resources with others. She uses her education to bless her family. Her husband talks respectfully about her and she of him. She works hard with her hands, her head, and her heart to bless her family and others. Her countenance radiates strength and goodness, and she thrives to allow her faith to overcome her fears of the future. She watches over family matters. She keeps her children and husband close to her heart and knows when to work and when to play. She speaks wisely and teaches faithfully, and when you question her wisdom, you will soon prove that she is always right, most of the time. She watches her children grow up, and regardless of the paths they choose, they know she loves them. Her husband appreciates all that she has done to nurture their children and tells her that often. Charm can fool us all. And beauty fades with time. But a woman who has respect for the Lord should be praised. Give her the reward she has earned. Speak it. Let everything she has done be honored by family, friends, and the community. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, the children are running a little bit late as they're coming, although we know that some are coming. So I was going to have them come forward. So again, I'm going to pick on Christine <laughs> and Sebastian. If you'd come forward. I have something that I wanted to show you, but i got to remember where I put it. Oh, there it is. And of course, you know, but you'll be able to read this. What does that say? Mom. Yes, that was quick. Mom. But turn upside down, what does it say? Oh, you already got me. <laughs> wow. I hope that you have a wow appreciation for your mom. I know that sometimes we don't always get along. I didn't always get along with my mom. But I have to say, as a mom, she wowed me. She was always there. Um, she'd correct me even when I didn't want it, even when I didn't think I needed it as well. But you know, we need to appreciate the people in our lives, the people around us. And so I, I hope that you will be able to express your wow to God for the wow that he's given you in your mom. And so, with that, we want you to be able to pass something out. And I'm a, we have some special things that were made by um, Annette and you. No? Okay. Annette. This is by a woman, Annette Celestian. She's not here with us. She doesn't participate physically with us. Um, but she made these for moms. I'm going to ask if Christine would hold on to these, and as you walk through the sanctuary, you can hand these out. Uh, probably there's enough for moms and also the guys to remember to wow uh, the women, uh, both of their past and also of their present, if you would. So go ahead and do that, and you girls can help pass those out, okay? Even as we have some prayer. Gracious, loving God, I thank you. You have given us a heritage. You have given us families from which we were raised, and hopefully we were given such wonderful... Sebastian, you can go ahead and help her. You can help pass them out. That we've been given a wonderful foundation upon which we can build our lives. There are many people that you bring our way. Some are moms to us that are not our biological moms. There are other persons, male, female, that you brought our way that they might contribute to our lives, and they have. Remind us in our celebration that we also lift up 
ourselves to you because we are to give ourselves to others, recognizing the fact that we contribute to the lives of others. May we provide those we touch in, with our lives a wonderful foundation for what can be wonderful lives for them. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen. And as the children finish handing out the angels to the angels in our midst, I invite you to sing with me hymn number 177, He is Lord. take their leave of us at this time, if they so wish, for the moments that they will have to worship and praise God and learn of him. Brian, can we sing happy birthday to Sebastian? Oh yes, we do, I forgot. We, it's on there, but we need to sing happy birthday to him. His birthday is today. No? I have it down wrong? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, so I got to correct that. Oh no, that's... My, Myron Sayre, his is the 11th, I'm sorry. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. And the best that you've ever had. I know that you and your sister and your brother are the twinkle of your mother's eye, even when your father is not. <laughs> I know, that, that happens, doesn't it? You know, you start it out, you think you're the twinkle of a woman's eye, and then all of a sudden there's the little one that comes in and you find your real place in the world, don't you? <laughs> well, I speaketh the truth from experience. Anyways, as we gather together, we want to also, yes, Sebastian is on the 11th, and Miller, who is, celebrates from home, we want to remind her that we appreciate her life. You can send her a card and give her a call, let her know that you appreciate her and pray that she has a wonderful birthday. But also, later on, Esther Williams, um, she has a birthday later this month on the 15th. And I hope that you'll, even though she watches us, hi Esther, she is probably on the screen right now. There's hand waving saying, um, I love you. She joins us from all the way in Wolcott, New York. And so uh, we want to wish her a happy uh, birthday too. But you know, Esther, we'll sing to you later, okay? We want to lift up in prayer. As we think about Mother's and Mother's Day, we also want to remember especially the mothers of Ukraine. Many of those who have lost children, many of those who have lost their husbands, many of those who are in despair, not knowing where their husbands who are fighting for their freedom and the stability of their country. We want to remember them um, in our prayers on this particular Mother's Day, remembering that Mother's Day is, can be a bright, joyful moment for many. For others, it can also be a painful moment. And so we have to acknowledge that. We want to remember to pray for the people of Ukraine. And if you want to, I have up here in this dish some crosses that have been made. And uh, they are in the color of the Ukrainian flag. And if you'd like to take one, you're asked to take one. And uh, 
Sometime later, we'll be, we already delivered our packages of gauze bandages and other things. I delivered those this week. And uh, we'll try to find some other ways that we can also support uh, Ukrainian people in the midst of their struggle. So these are here for you after service. Be free to take one if you would. There are other concerns that are before you as we look at them. We want to lift up, as I announced that last week, uh, a new Methodist church uh, denomination was birthed, the Global Methodist Church. And I uh, don't have much details to give to you regarding that. Um, but uh, so our own United Methodist Church is now a disunited Methodist Church. Uh, so we want to be praying for the church. We want to be praying for um, its people, our brothers and sisters who are not in the United Methodist fold at this time. And we want to be praying for peace and healing uh, for all people. Uh, there are other concerns that are listed before you. We want to lift up Pam and Peter's not here because Pam and Peter, she fell, and of course, and she's healing. Uh, I took communion to her the other day. Um, and we also want to be praying for Karen. She thought that she was free and her family was free from COVID. And then it started coming back around for her. So she's not with us today and um, to teach and, and uh, with her children uh, because of a resurgence of COVID in her family. So please be praying for Karen as well, Karen Gloyd. Other other concerns? Yes, Dominic. Pray for me. <laughs> we'll pray for you. Dom, we haven't stopped praying for you no, I since I met you. <laughs> no, really, they tried to fall on me, so I'm recovering. You, know, so. you got to be careful when you tow a boat up a hill. Not a tractor. At least you didn't have a hole in the boat. Oh, that. <laughs> Yes, we do pray for your healing that you, you know. And we're thankful you didn't get more severely injured than you could have. Okay. Are there other concerns for prayer? We want to uh, welcome their Viggy and her fa their family, Sandra Figgy and her family that she's, that's worshiping with her today. And it's so good to see your face. Hope you had a wonderful time away during the winter, and we're glad to have you back. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> I would remind you that there are prayer cards that we have in the pews. There's also some out in the lounge. We ask that if you do have a concern for prayer that we might be able to share, uh, please fill them out and place them either in the offering plate when they're passed or also uh, in the receptacle out in the lounge so that we could be praying uh, for the concerns that you have. Let us now take these concerns in silence before God, who, as we found out last week from Romans 8, utters our needs and our concerns to God with words that we just cannot find to adequately express what we feel. But the Holy Spirit translates them to him. God knows, God hears, God cares, and God responds. Let us pray. Hear our hearts, O oh Lord. We truly pray, though sometimes it's hard, not for our will to be done, but for your will to be done. In all things, in all ways. You taught us how to pray. And so we pray. The pattern and words that you so gave us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to add, if I, you know, the Holy Spirit's just telling me, I want to add Jake. Uh, Hannah's here. Jake is off taking care of uh, family needs, as his father has had a very difficult uh, uh, time, and I know it's been a concern for him. So we want to be praying for Jake and his mom and uh, all that they're going through with, with their dad. Uh, so please uh, be adding Jake to your prayers as well. Last week, I shared with you the story behind that hymn that a lot of people love, Because He Lives, but we only sang the chorus. But today, we're going to sing the full hymn today, and that is Because He Lives, number 364. about how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. I always wondered, uh, my 
mind why it was only he. Sometimes when I've sung this, I've changed it to they. And uh, to be inclusive of both men and women, you know, male and child, and, and also female. But also, uh, in learning about the background, this was written during a time in which the Gaither family was going through great trial. And not only as they were going through great turmoil, they also had our country was going through great turmoil. And Gloria was uh, pregnant with their first son. And so they questioned, was this the right time to bring a child into this broken world? I think every parent who is a conscientious parent oftentimes question themselves with that same question. We see the world and we wonder what is it that we are giving to our children? What is our inheritance to them? But yet the joy that they bring, um, even though we know the trials they have to go through, is well worth it. So that is the background to that hymn, I would remind you. And I'd ask if our ushers could now come forward that we might receive the offerings of this day uh, towards the work of Christ and his kingdom through this church. <coughs> I think she deserves a good applause for that, don't you? to us from Acts 15, 19 through 41. I'm beginning with this passage as an opening to the series uh, based upon the book that I wrote actually in 2008 called uh, Irreconcilable Differences, in which I was anticipating and writing uh, the reasons for what I saw was going to be the division within the church. It has affected other churches. Uh, we're the last major denomination to, to face that uh, theological division that uh, truly is, has afflicted our, our church and the church 
um, and other churches. Uh, the first passage is Acts 15, verses 19 through 41. Please give heed to its words. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friend Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers and sisters there. And after spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work on their first missionary journey. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some questions of life and faith for you to consider. What impressions do our unbelieving neighbors form in their observation of our families, and our churches. Is it fair to expect that Christians will always get along with one another? Do they know we are Christians by our love? Can anything good from the church's brokenness and failure. Let's think on these things. As I walked into church, I heard several people referring to Mother's Day. And they were actually echoing some things that I have oftentimes felt. That Mother's Day, while we lift it up to be, or what we actually call in the calendar, the festival of the Christian home, is for some a time of joy. For others, is a time of sorrow. Sorrow for many different reasons. Joy because if you've had a great familiar experience and you've had great mothers, you can then easily lift up the blessings that you have received. Some find it difficult because 
the mothers that they have are no longer there. So it's a time of joy, but it's also a time of sorrow. There are others who find it difficult during this time because they didn't have the mothers that maybe they felt that they should have had and deserved. When it comes to Father's Day, I also remind the men that that's true as well. There are many who have been dissuaded from God because of the experience of the lack of fathers that they deserved, should have had. We find that that also causes a difficulty within people's lives. There's a sorrow, sorrow from what we miss and have lost. There's a sorrow from what we had hoped that we might have but didn't have. I remember years ago that uh, when I was serving church down the southern tier, and my mother, after my father died, uh, we brought her back, and she was actually my music director for the church that I served. And it was kind of interesting to have a, a preacher that had his mother, you know, in the congregation leading music, but that was okay. That was very good. I remember that first Mother's Day that she was there, and I preached a sermon called My Mean Mom. And you know, my mother, whenever she came to visit wherever I was, it was towards that time, she would say, are you going to preach that sermon again? She liked it. She would say she was mean for a purpose, and that she would look at me and, and sometimes say, well, I did a good job. And then sometimes she'd say, I should have been meaner. <laughs> but you know, there's, a, there's joy we can find. There's also sorrow we can find. I know that my wife had an experience we celebrated with all her family yesterday um, at her mom's. And she's going to become 80 this next year, but she's had some health problems. She was also my associate pastor at one time. That's how I met my wife. The, uh, and the, so they had to pull the children aside to have a conversation of what's going the future going to look like. That becomes sad as well. to have to think about those things. We also know that in our families that we like to lift up and think that our families should be perfect. And a lot of people from outside the church should look upon those who claim to follow Christ and kind of advocate that, well, there's nothing in Christianity because, look at um, families are not perfect. Even Christian families are not perfect. And so the, one of the questions I asked you, is it fair that we expect that families, Christian families, should be perfect? I know many of you, and I know many of your family situations. And I've been free to tell you some of my own. And I can tell you that you're not alone. There are no perfect family situations. There are no perfect families. The question is not whether we are functional or dysfunctional. It's a matter of what level of dysfunction we live in. Okay. Because it is grace by which we are saved. And so what happens is we only come to that salvation by admitting our own faults and failures and counting the blessings that we have, but also to apply that grace to ourselves, to those who are in our families. I'd be honest with you and share that I have a broken relationship with my, with my only sister, my only sibling. I try my best. At least I think it's my best. For some reason, uh, there's a rift between us and may never be healed. But as far as on my part, I will continue to try to love and express that concern. You know, and, and many of you have those type of things too, or you know of families that do. Is it fair that we should be counted as having perfect homes? No. It is true, though, because of the values that we teach and preach that we should be better at it. We should have a better record, I think, than a, a lot of families that don't have those values. That's a challenge to us. Do we live up to those values that we've been raised and taught with? To live them out in our lives. I want to transition from talking about our individual families to talk about the church. The church is not perfect. Oh, if you talk to anyone about Jesus and faith, and they're going to always point to the church. Well, look at the church. Look at the history. 
Look at the failures. Look at the blemishes. Look at all the bad. I've read so many different emails that people have posted and their hatred for God because of the church. You know, it's, uh, it's sad. The reason why I chose this passage is I was reminded of it from Eileen's study when they looked at, you know, Paul, man of grit and grace. Chuck Swindoll spoke about this, but I, it made me remember. It made me think about it. You see, the Apostle Paul in the early church, we think, was pretty perfect. And they really had a, a unity and had some challenges, though. Remember some of the challenges that they had? All of a sudden, some Hellenistic Jews felt that they were being uh, overlooked. Their widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food because... All these people came from such a distance, you know, to celebrate Passover, and all of a sudden they met Jesus, and all of a sudden they stayed beyond, they'd go home. And all of a sudden the community there that came to faith had to support these folks. And so they felt that they, their widows were not being treated fairly. First challenge. And so what they did with wisdom and guidance of God, they chose deacons, people uh, who were Hellenistic Jewish leaders to oversee the distribution. Smart move. Man, that was smart. But you know, there were God-fearers, people who were not Jews, who, who all of a sudden followed Jesus. And the Jews who started following Jesus, you know, well, what do we do with these God-fearers? Of course, God wants them, but what do we do? Well, we got to make them into Jews first. And all of a sudden, the Lord worked in Peter's heart, and he had a vision and in his vision, he also saw that what God really wanted as he went to Cornelius' house and found the Holy Spirit had come upon these non-Jews and they fully appreciated Jesus as the Savior, their Savior. He went back and advocated for that. Paul, who was a persecutor of Jews, all of a sudden went out with Barnabas and he then went and established churches in the first missionary journey. They were mostly out of Antioch and farther northward through Turkey and such, and were able, they were Gentile, mostly Gentile. There's some Jews that embraced, but they're mostly Gentile, non-Jews. They came back and there were some Jews that came among them and, and thinking, well, you've got to become Jews before you can accept our Jesus, our Messiah. And so Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem where the church began and Advocated. This is not right. This is not fair. Give evidence of the, the real faith that people had, had been transformed by. And so they wrote back a response and sent dignitaries with them back to the church in Antioch. The Antioch where the church first became called, Christians became called Christians. No greater burden on you than these few requirements, he said. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. That's all we expect of you, to follow Jesus. Very limited in what they required, isn't it? And the people were glad to hear it when they came and let them know that. So things look perfect. No, oh, again, the church resolved a conflict that could have just exploded and destroyed and we wouldn't have the church today in our history. But another problem. You know, whenever you get through problems, there's always another one, isn't there? Of course there has to be. All of a sudden, on that first journey, missionary journey, they took a young man named John Mark with them. But you know, it was really hard, and if you read the description of the territory they went and the hardships of sleeping on the ground, of the beatings and the rejection that they suffered, and the territory they had to go through, and John Mark was responsible for their travel plans. He was their assistant in that. All of a sudden, he got tired and disappointed and disillusioned, and all of a sudden, he turned around and went home. They finished their journey and came back home, and... All of a sudden, Paul had a great idea. Let's go back and visit those churches that we established to make sure they're doing well. Barnabas, his friend, said, Yeah, let's do that. That's a good idea. Let's do that. I'd long to see them again. Let's take John Mark with us. 
which Paul said, no way. He let us down before. Hasn't been that long. He's going to let us down again. I don't know what side you might be on or whatever. Paul had his point. Barnabas, being the ever-encourager, would say, oh, we got to give him another chance. Everyone deserves a second chance. Amen? And how many chances do you give for people to let you down? <laughs> Joe says two. So Paul, you know, who was correct, Paul or, 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 or Barnabas? In verse 39, it says, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Isn't that sad? A true defeat. We don't, and Barnabas took his, his young cousin. Maybe that was one reason why he wanted to give him more chances than he deserved. He wanted, he went off with John Mark. Back home. Whereas Paul then took Silas and he moved on to finish the mission. And the church sent them off with blessing. We don't read anything from there of Barnabas and Paul being together. Was that disagreement so sharp that they broke faith and fellowship with one another? I don't know. I don't think that Luke includes the answer to that because it's meant to teach us today, are we going to let our disagreements be that which totally divides us? And I'm not talking about just on the national level or international level. I'm talking about with our own families and our own communities. What happens? What are we, how do we respond? What are we to do? You know, I want to tell you that uh, church has been rife with all sorts of divisions in its history. And the best thing that we can do as Christians is just to admit it. If someone likes to raise that to put it in front of my face, I say, you're right. The church has failed and struggled many times, and the church has struggled many times because the church has you and me in it. And when we come to the church, we also bring who we are, our failings and our faults, our own opinions and our own agendas, the way we expect that things are to be. You know, we do that with our families as well. We bring our expectations, and sometimes our expectations are greater than the reality that we can achieve. And that's why there's grace. What I find is so unique within this passage that I share with you is that while I think that Barnabas and, and Paul did have a reconciliation, I say this because of some other places that Paul refers to Mark. In 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul requests Mark to come to him. He is helpful to me in my ministry, he writes. In the, his shortest letter, it's only one chapter, uh, in verse 24 of Philemon, he refers to Mark as his fellow worker. Isn't that interesting? Then Colossians in his letter 4, uh, verse 10, Paul asks that they ask the Colossians to welcome Mark, whom he is sending to them to represent him. <laughs> oh, grace is so wonderful. We see that there was second chances, third chances, other chances, right? But also with each chance, Mark had to prove himself. And like you and I, we have to prove ourselves too. Not to God so much, because God knows us, but we need to prove ourselves to ourselves. Can I be the loving person of character that God wants me to be? In our families and some of the struggles that we have, we have the chance, are we going to live above those struggles and, and those obstacles and truly love as God wants us to love? That doesn't mean that we agree. And you know, as Richard Foster points out as he reviews the history of the church, is that with each broken or division within the church, some new emphasis, some new truth was lifted up. 
and we have a clearer picture of what God really wanted. I've anticipated this division within the United Methodist Church for years and years. I didn't think it was going to happen when I got to be an old man. I thought it was going to happen a lot sooner than now. But, you know, God has his own timing. God has his own plan. And I'm not saddened by it. Because I think that God is going to do some good work through it. That God is going to clarify the truth. And that God is going to strengthen the faith of his people. And they're at issue, truly, in this division that's happening. It's over the authority of scripture. And then how we interpret scripture. I want to repeat that. The real source of the division is over the authority of scripture and how we interpret the scripture. I also want to lift up about how they resolve this problem with the Gentile Christians. A few requirements. I remember John Wesley, and it's not just him, he, st he stole from a lot of different people. And a lot of other people have claimed this expression. And I don't want to leave it with you, but John Wesley used it a lot. He said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. I want to repeat that. I want you to put that in your heart, because I think it's truth from God. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. As they wrote, these Gentile Christians, these then became, as they debated them, these are the essentials. This is all that we require to you besides following Jesus. These are what's in the word, and I want to just share them briefly with you. Abstain from eating food offered to idols. Oh, well, gee, we don't have to worry about that today. We don't go out and, hey, I want the, uh, I want this uh, meat that's offered to Artemis. No, we don't want to do that, you know. But we don't realize that as we live out in our world, there are many idols that exist. I could define them for you, some of them anyways, because there are too many to number. And we are asked that we're going to follow those values that some may be complementary to our faith values and some are not going to be. And we are told to reject those that are not according to our faith values. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by the very word of God. He was not talking about bread like we broke yet last week. He's talking about what gives us life and direction in our lives. We either will adopt some cultural values, no matter what culture you're in, no matter what country you're in, you're either going to adopt and follow those values or you're going to decide, no, I trust and I believe in the values that Christ has taught and I'm going to follow those. It's our choice. So the same thing is required of us. We must abstain from eating food offered to idols. The next one are, is connected. We must abstain from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals. Blood from the Old Testament was said to contain life, and we were to respect life. You did not eat the blood, and I'm not criticizing any of you who like your steak raw. Well. That's not the point, okay? You're missing the point. As oftentimes we read and interpret scripture, we miss the point. Blood has, is, carries life. You lose too much blood, you're going to die. It carries your life in it. And so it was respect blood. Respect life. God gave you life. God gave the other person life. You respect that life. And you also show compassion. Why does it say don't eat the meat from strangled animals? Do you know a strangled animal suffers? There's a faster way in which an animal can be killed. And so what they're basically saying is respect life and you also are compassionate. We call it being human. Only problem is what I see as being human is not too human. 
not the way God intended humanity to be. And the third one is sexual immorality. Why is that so important? Because it's one of the biggest idols that our culture and cultures of the past. In Paul's time, they actually had temple prostitutes. Can you imagine that? Hey, we'd have a good time in church. We'd fill these pews. But in other times, there were other types of in which sexuality became, oh, that def defines us, but it doesn't define you. We are more than sexuality. God made us to be more. And yet people follow that idol. Look at the TV commercials. How many TV commercials do you see that doesn't elevate sexual Life as being, oh, that's where it is. Hey, use this type of perfume. You're going to get those guys to follow you, you know. You, all sorts of different things. Even worse. Does that define our character? No, it should not. And so those restrictions, those three restrictions are still in effect to this day. And the surface issue for the divide is over the interpreting and authority of Scripture, but the surface problem is over are issues of human sexuality. But you know, I believe that, as I said before, that God has his hand. God is refining and purifying his people so they might remember what is truly important. I have a friend who married another friend of mine. They could never be intimate because of her disability. And yet, they have one of the strongest marriages and intimacy beyond sexuality than I have ever seen. Why do we lift that which is so base up to being an idol for us? And how many lives have been harmed? How many people are being brought by cartels to be human trafficking, to be used in the sex trade? We should be ashamed, but we should be challenged. I'm going to follow the values of Jesus Christ. And that is the challenge for us. And as we go back to the scriptures, we might understand what truly is necessary for us to follow Jesus Christ, who himself was never married, who himself was sexually pure, who himself never harmed another human being. May that be our challenge. And so I ask as I end my, this message for today, and invite you to follow us as we continue on exploring these areas, if you join me in our common prayer. O oh God, we come before you as a family of faith. You remind us that blood is thicker than water. We take that rightfully to mean that our family, those who share the same blood, are the closest and greatest treasure to our lives. Yet if we are honest, we will admit that while we desire this intimacy, it is often missing. Our families are often broken by sharp differences of opinions betrayals of trust and memories or fears which scar us. It is true that blood is thicker than water. That is, when it is your blood that unites us. We confess there are people we know through our faith in you who become to us a mother, a father, sister, and brother, closer than those whose blood we share physically. It is your blood that you shed on the cross that draws us together. We recognize our common need for grace to cover our sin, heal our wounds, and forgive our past. We have learned that water is not enough, meaning the water of our baptism. Though we are committed to following you, we acknowledge our frailty and failure to love one another as you loved us and called us to love one another. Where there have been a sister or brother in faith, we have injured, judged unfairly, and settled for something less 
than you have planned, we return to intimacy with one another only through your blood. Remind us of our commitment expressed through the water of our baptism and instill in us the love that you modeled in your sacrifice. For true love is measured by the sacrifices we make for one another rather than the demands we place upon one another. Make us truly a family that loves as you love. Amen. I invite you to close this time. I know I've taken this over. If you rise to your feet and we'll sing number 223, 2223 in the black hymnal, they'll know we are Christians by our love. from you into the relationships that you are involved in every single day, whether they be close or just acquaintances, may your love be shown to them. Through the differences of opinion and also all those discouraging times, may you know that Jesus is near and he holds each one dear. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.